everyone. Welcome to the Evolution of Media Creation 2030 Vision with Movie Labs. Joining us today, we have Daniel Lucas and Mark Turner from Movie Labs, and we'll be talking with them in just a moment. Before we get started, we just wanted to go through a couple of housekeeping items. So we're going to be doing the welcome and introductions in a moment. Um, I'll be talking to you about a few things that we want to just let you know before the webinar starts in terms of how you ask questions. Then we'll go into our panel discussion with Mark and Daniel. Then we'll take your questions. If you submitted one in your registration process, we'll probably get to that. Um, and we'll also be taking questions during the webinar. And then we'll just have our closing remarks. In terms of the housekeeping, I just wanted to let everyone know, if you have a question during the webinar for Mark or Daniel, um, we're gonna be using the Q&A feature there at the bottom of your Zoom window for that. You can type in your question there and we will try to answer them at the end. We never have time for everyone's questions. So bear with us if we don't get to yours, um, but we will try. Um, if you have just a general comment, then you can put that in the chat. If you wanna direct that at all attendees kind of thing and just make a general comment about the material you're seeing, that's just fine. So um, in terms of the questions you can ask, we'd like them to stay on topic. If you have questions that are off topic, we ask you to, re to send those along to our support channel at support at Celtics.com. So getting started, uh, if you've attended another webinar, you know myself and Nicole quite well by now, I'd say. Uh, so I'll be your host for this webinar as will Nicole. I'll be leading the initial portion with Mark and Daniel and then Nicole will be taking over to do the questions from our community. Also joining us from the Celtic side are Laura, Chelsea, and Junior, who you're also probably very familiar with if you've been to another webinar, and they'll be helping out in the Q&A and in the chat. Today we have with us Movie Labs. We have Mark Turner and Daniel Lucas. Mark, if you just wanna wave so everyone knows which one you are, I think we can tell from the photos there, and Daniel's there next to Mark with a nice Christmas background. We'll be asking them a bit more about themselves in just a moment, but you would have had a chance to read their bios on our materials that we sent out to you beforehand. So to get started, I did want to give you a little bit of information about Celtics. Um, we have a quote here from our senior product manager at Celtics, um, and we just want to give you an idea of what's going to happen next year with us. So we're going to be doubling down on creative ideation. Um, and we're gonna look at less linear narratives, less linear approaches to starting those narratives. So instead of necessarily starting right in the script, you might wanna start with your index cards or something like that. That's what we're gonna be really focusing on next year. A couple of things that we have coming out in the very first quarter of next year is a newer, more intuitive way to navigate your project documents. We're gonna have improved sharing and permission controls going to have just overall smoother performance, less load screens, less waiting around. Uh, hopefully in the first quarter, we're also going to have a lovely new game and VR project that lets you write the way you want to write instead of being stuck into a, a uh, map. And we're going to have a whole new webinar series starting next year where we're going to take you from ideation right up to creation through the 12 months of the year. That's just our little Celtics update. Now we'll get right into the meat of this webinar. Um, so Mark and Daniel, we'll get started right away. Um, can you tell us a little more about Movie Labs, your vision statement and how you got started? Sure. <clears throat> Hi everyone. Um, so yes, Movie Labs, um, we are a joint venture of the major um, motion picture studios here in Hollywood. We actually have an office in San Francisco, one here in LA, and then um, we've got people in Europe and in Vancouver as well. So we, uh, we focus on technology. Our board of directors is literally the CTOs from those major studios. Um, and we are there predominantly. We were started 17 years ago, Daniel. It's a while ago. 15, yeah. Well, yeah. Just, yes. but yeah, we started on distribution technology, actually. That was, if you look back in, in history, there was a time of uh, terrible piracy and stuff in movies. We started on helping studios work through how are we going to try and narrow down the amount of um, digital theft that was going on. And have been work over the years, we've been working our way up to the production chain. So 
the 2030 vision we're going to talk about here today um, is the latest part of that sort of working our way out of distribution and all the way up into the content creation, um, right from ideation, now covering everything all the way throughout through distribution and OTT and, and everything beyond. Um, so I'm not going to read you the, um, the mission statement, but you can, um, you can find out more about movielabs.com. And um, I'll say one thing is we publish a whole bunch of paperwork, um, blog posts, um, these formal papers that we do, there's ontologies and there's other data formats and stuff. Whenever we put out something new, we do an announcement on LinkedIn. So the best way to find out about what's happening in Movie Lab is just follow us on LinkedIn and then you sort of track along with what we're working on. That's a great suggestion. I love your blog. I was like reading through it and I found, you know, the vision papers are great. They can be a bit heavy to read through. Yeah. The blog just breaks everything we know. down in smaller <laughs> chunks. So yeah. <laughs> definitely. And, and the blogs, it, it was intended because um, those papers, because wh whatever we publish, you can view as coming from five major studios. There was actually six when we started, but Disney acquired Fox, so we're down to five. Right. Um, so whenever we put a formal paper out, you know, view it as came from Disney, came from Warner Brothers, came from Universal. Um, the blogs is something, and, and therefore we can't ideate those very fast. The blogs, we can get out a lot faster. So a lot of our sort of latest thinking, where our head's at on sort of a, an idea is out in our, is in our blog. Um, and there's three coming out in January that we've already written that are ready to go. So awesome. it didn't seem worth pushing in that now. No, <laughs> don't always get the greatest readership during exactly. the, <laughs> towards the end of December there. That's great. I was going to say um, the other thing. I think the other thing about the blogs is also that you know we have a lot of different strands to this sort of this whole program, this evolution, and you know if you're no matter what you do, you probably have an air, a particular area of sort of specialty or or sort of interest. And sure, that that might make sense to go sort of deep into one of the papers, the white papers. But I think what the blogs do is kind of give you those sort of short little overviews of of sort of everything that's going on because it does all sort of fit together in a lot of different ways. So even if you don't need that detail, it's a good place to kind of get that sense of the 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 overriding kind of concepts and ideas. Right. Yeah. Definitely. It's uh, when I first started visiting your website, you know, we had been working with you for a, a little while and um, I had read the blog post on the ontology and in my head, it was like, well, movie labs, they're all about the ontology. And then I went to the blogs and I was like, oh no, it's a lot more than just that, isn't it? So it is a really great way to get a, the full picture, but in sort of digestible chunks, yeah. which is nice. Speaking of which, you do do a lot more than, well, a lot of people. <laughs> um, so you have identified several key areas for innovation. Um, the move to the cloud for all production and enhanced common security, software-defined workflows, common data and yeah. graphic libraries, just to mention a few. Um, did you want to just run through what you're working on, all of those different pieces and how they work together? And then I have a, a follow-up question for you after that. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let, let's start with um, where did this 2030 vision come from? And, and it, you know, it goes back further. Why 2030? Um, so this, um, this paper came out in 2019. Um, so before pandemic, uh, <laughs> which seems like a world away. It was only three years. Um, uh, two years. But um, a lot of the studios have been experimenting in cloud production and some of these new ideas, some of them are calling it Studio 3.0. Some of them were exploring, um, you know, new software tools, virtual production. There's a whole bunch of sort of experimentation going on. But there was no sort of central studio point of view that the rest of the industry could get their head around. Um, so the point in writing that 2030 paper was to be able to go to the rest of the industry, technology, um, providers, vendors, cloud companies, everybody else and say, look, this is how the studios collectively view the future of production. And we didn't do, you know, it was 2019. We didn't do a sort of what do we think it'll be like in three years because everybody gets upset, you know, oh, is game engine technology going to be more advanced? Uh, you know, what is the cloud going to be? Is it still going to be expensive? And blah, 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 blah. So we deliberately blew it out 10 years to get away from all those sort of short-term conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, 10 years gives you enough time to be able to put aside the sort of short-term political arguments and worry about, can we all agree that we're going to be here? Um, and there were 10 principles in that 2030 paper. This is a sort of 
short version of the of the ten principles. Um, and I'll cover them all quickly. You can get me the paper if you want, but um, just to give you a, a, a level set here, so we're all thinking about the same stuff. The first part is around cloud production. So the first of those five five principles on the left there are, you know, what we call the cloud foundation. Um, and and the central premise in a lot of this is whatever you're creating um, any sort of asset, whether it be an actual script or um, video or audio or editing EDLs, whatever it might be, all of that goes straight to the cloud. And then it stays there, which seems like a really obvious statement, um, but that's not the way it's been doing, done today, right? We have various different cloud services um, and that whole bunch of local infrastructure. And there's all, therefore all this inefficiency about moving files. You know, files are constantly moving in our industry and they're chasing the creative typically. So, um, you know, you'll have a post-production house move a file over to a marketing house and marketing tool, you know, they'll send their EDL back over here and they have these files constantly moving around the place, which is incredibly wasteful um, and time consuming. And there's always a chance whenever you move stuff that you lose it, you break it, it breaks the security model, you know, you just lose track of stuff. Um, and it's horribly inefficient. So the idea is all files are either created in the cloud or they are moved immediately to the cloud, and then they do not move. Mm-hmm. And what you do instead is you share out permissions so that you know I can give Daniel permission to get access to my script. If he's approved it, it'll go on to the next person in the step. As we start adding media, um, they'll be added into the cloud, and then I'll invite people in. Um, And those parts then sort of lead into the second block here, which is security and access, which says um, a zero trust approach to security. It says you don't have to worry about um, having secure perimeters around every single facility that you use and you worry about hackers getting into the media. You basically protect the entire workflow and every step in the chain. So if I am sharing something to Daniel, I know it's Daniel. This is the single identity idea here. So there's there's one Daniel Lucas in the platform. So if I'm sharing to him, I know it's actually going to be him. I give him enough permission to do the work he needs to do on only the files he needs to get access to. And at the end of that task, boom, his access disappears. So I don't need to worry about, you know, I just shared an unreleased piece of content with someone on a hard drive. Are they going to delete it afterwards? What happens if they leave the hard drive on the on the train on the way home? You know, none of that stuff needs to worry about. It's all in the cloud. It, permission is only given to those required. Um, and that sounds like it might be a really complex um, process, but it's actually very standard for sort of IT workflows in every other industry in the world. We're the only ones that are sort of running around with really, really important assets, you know, on unencrypted hard drives, sort of mailing them to people. <laughs> just, or paper, uh, emailing them to people, which yeah. seems pretty basic. Um, so security access, there's a whole bunch of sections around that. And um, uh, so we'll come back to that one in a minute. And then on top of those two foundations, then you can start doing the fun stuff, which is building new and more efficient workflows. We call all of them software defined workflows on the basis that they are faster to iterate. Um, a lot of workflow right now is driven by the hardware or the equipment that people are using. And we want to get away from that idea. We won't be able to, people will be able to share, add metadata, add an application into the middle of a workflow and not have the entire workflow break, which is what happens right now. Um, it's very limiting of innovation when, you know, if you look at a major movie, it's a two year, maybe three year production cycle. Um, and no one wants to iterate or innovate in the middle of that cycle because like, don't break anything. It's working. The workflow is working. Don't touch anything. And then there's this tiny little window where a producer or a studio will come up for air and say, all right, now we've got a chance to try something new and experiment. But then once we go back down again, everything locks down again. And that is really limiting from an innovation point of view. So we want the ability for workflows to change and iterate and not have everything break, which is actually really hard <laughs> to do. Um, so some of the stuff we'll talk about later around ontologies things are actually designed to um, allow that and then the last one on here is around game engines effectively or what we're calling real-time engines the ability to iterate faster and um, so you're not waiting constantly for a render to occur you know you might wait 24 hours for a big movie render to occur for people to then look at it and approve it 
which is really wasteful. So, you know, is there ways that we can look at speeding up iteration cycles? Is there a way we can take, you know, real-time technologies and put them on set or before set and do virtual production or previs and much more like an animation workflow, actually, where you're sort of iterating with the quality and the quality increases, you get closer to release. Um, But how can we do that with live action? So, you know, a lot of them are short term, Um, A lot of them are foundational, but they all come together to give us a sort of common goal that we're all now shooting for across the industry. So hopefully that was useful. So, uh, Daniel, was there anything you wanted to add before I I went with my follow-up question? Oh, I... (laughs) (laughs) He knows what we're up to. (laughs) So, I mean, you've definitely already touched upon this, that everything is connected, but... uh, with everything that you're working on, I guess in terms of rolling it out, do you see them as interdependent or discrete efforts that can be implemented independently? Can we start with one and move on to another kind of thing? Or is it all going to happen in one fell swoop? <laughs> yeah. We, um, we started having them very distinctly chunked into these groups. Mm. Um, we have very distinct projects going on in each one of these areas. Um, and we certainly started with security. Well, we, we started with security because you can't add it on later. Yes. You know, the, one of the security principles is about security by design. So you can't just throw in security afterwards. So we did start there to a certain extent. Um, so the security one is further ahead than others. We've published a full architecture, parts one through three, parts four through six are coming, you know, early next year. And the idea is that people can actually start building the security system right now. It's all available technology. There's nothing funky in there that you know doesn't exist yet. Um, and the reason why we did that is, you know, we can then start plugging stuff into it. Um, what we when we started playing with some of the workflow stuff, um, that is actually quite tied into security as well. I said there was this idea of sort of workflow driving security and not security driving workflow. So you know, if I want to set up a workflow and and drag and drop people into it. Um, That actually ends up defining my security model for me. So now we started on boiling down workflows into their component parts, um, which rather easily, if you, all workflows basically boil down in this way, you have participants, um, which in our cases, it could be a person, but it could be a team. It could be a whole vendor, it could be a company. We have participants uh, doing tasks, um, working on assets, um, using infrastructure. I mean, that's basically it. You can, you can boil most workflows down to that, right? It could be the writer writing the script in a certain document using a Mac locally on the desktop. But likewise, you can also say, well, I've got something as complex as um, you know, final render, well, that's happening on this piece of software on this cloud, and it's run in this process by this person. Um, but you, once you start boiling workflows down into those component parts, um, we have a lot of computer scientists, one of which is Daniel, who's on this call. Um, you know, they break stuff down into a way that you can then describe it. What we started realizing is you can't actually build something as complex as uh, as uh, making a TV show um, without getting down to some really fundamental base levels. Like, um, you know, what do you mean by shot? Do you mean it was a, a take or was someone shot? Um, and computers, <laughs> some computers have a real problem with with understanding nuance. Well, a take and a shot it. are not the same thing, so be careful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so uh, take shot yeah. exactly. These, <laughs> but these it's a good example. Words <laughs> and um, and what the task is and who really does it. What is the description on the person that does that? None of that stuff had actually been defined, so it's really hard to try and you know write out or draw out a workflow when it isn't clear in a lot of cases, what do we mean by this task and who is the person doing it? So the first step, you mentioned it, was this ontology, which sounds, you know, I always thought the word ontology sounds phenomenally dull, but what it really means is we're gonna define every single little piece of these, these pieces of DNA that, that make, up, make up a workflow. What do we mean by them all? Can we all agree to them all? And then you can actually put two computers together and they can send a message to each other, for example, which is, you know, this part of this task is now done. I'm sending this on to you, which avoids a human having to go do that. Um, and it's not about um, trying to remove humans through AI. Um, it's actually about automating the boring bits that no one likes to do. 
you know, hey, I, uh, did you finish that file yet? No, I haven't done. I've got a little bit more to do on it. Oh, when you finish it, can you email it over here and or send it to this guy? He needs to take a look at it. You know, there's tons of that that goes on in a production. It's a very iterative cycle. Um, but the way people are tracking its progress is by phone calls and emails. And it's just a phenomenal waste of everybody's time. Creatives like to do creative things, not, you know, sit around approving things and sending messages around us find out if they got everything in the package. So we're looking to automate a lot of that. And for that, we need an ontology and that we need to sort of standardize some of the language. So we are working our way up. So we've done security, we've done this software defined workflow, this sort of framework for um, describing things. And then we'll get, as, as the years tick by, we're gonna get into some of the more um, fun stuff where we can start plugging together applications and making you know, whole automated pipelines. And I think, yeah, I mean, with the ontology, I think one of the important things to sort of remember for people you know, who don't make computer software for a living and, you know, make movies, for example, it's humans are really good at deriving, you know, the, the contextual meaning of a word based on who they're talking to, the thing they're talking about, the situation they're in. So you can take the word shot and use that in multiple different ways with different people, all with slightly different meanings, but people get, they're able, we're, we're really good at being able to interpret what, you know, what it means at that point in time. Computers are not. That's and that's where a lot of this sort of fundamental problem comes. So a lot of the focus of, of our work, particularly around the ontology, is you know, how do two systems communicate with one another? And if you want one system to send data or information about something, you need them to both have the same idea of what shot means or take or character or you know, any one of the other things that we've sort of gone through and, and, and sort of tried to define here. And so the idea is not that everybody who makes a movie has to suddenly you know, go to this ontology and if you're not using the word correctly, you know, you'll be thrown off set, right? It's really the key is about you know, people making software understanding that if I get this payload of information about something, that's what we mean, right? Um, and, and that's where it gets sort of really Im Im important. Yeah, definitely. I, a while back, we tried to use AI in our breakdown, and that was one of the issues that we came into, was that the AI yeah. just didn't understand the concepts of breakdown the way a human does. So it would yeah. say that a car was a prop when a car is a vehicle, you know, and things like that. Yeah. So it, it's an but interesting... But sometimes the car is a prop. And that's Sometimes the problem, right? problem. In context, exactly. the car may have been a prop. It may have been a child who was playing with a car. Exactly. And it's really hard to understand it, it, that. It may also have been just how you got to the set that day. <laughs> <laughs> it may just be right. just picking up you the know. stars. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No. <laughs> exactly. Um, that's really interesting. And I, I think anyone who is in a creative process, you know, they're not always thinking about the software that's helping them with that creative process. But I think yeah. we've all run into that issue where it's like, you know, you're importing a spreadsheet from one place to another and the headings aren't exactly the same. So you lose some of your data during the import process. So the idea is you like shouldn't that. really have to think about it. Exactly. And, you know, it's the software's job. And this is part of, you know, in thinking about, you know, building these things, it's the software's job to be able to kind of help you, not push you into some, you know, predefined sort of idea of what that is, right? particularly when you're moving that information between them. And, and that's where, you know, where the software has an understanding of these things, it, it can start to move things. You don't have to redo things. You don't lose things, et cetera. Exactly. No, well, that's great. Um, so we've talked a bit about the software defined workflows. We haven't talked about them that much because I know that's a little further along in your, in your mission statement, your vision. Um, but could you describe that in a little more detail? I mean, we've just talked about this just now, you know, how the software should be deciding what you do. Um, but do you feel that creativity is dependent upon human driven workflows and processes? And what benefit do you see the software defined workflow adding? Like I said, we yeah. touched upon that a bit, but we, could you we touched on it? It's the flexibility is, is the key, right? And Creating video is a creative process. I mean, it literally is an iterative creative process. Um, and, and too often it's actually constrained by the workflow, mm -hmm. right? And people go, well, we want to do it this way. We have to do it this way or I lose track of stuff. And we want to get away from that, right? We want to get people to be creative. We want people to iterate in real time. We want people to be able to make a change, see what it looks like and not feel like they can't 
innovate either in the way they're doing it or in the files that are being created you know say say someone wants to use a different camera for a particular shot or a different lens and and uh you know that actually causes a whole problem, a bunch of problems. When you're doing visual effects, you're doing a big movie, someone throws in the fact that, well, in this particular shot, we use a different aspect ratio and a completely different lens. Um, and because we wanted it to be really wide, wide, wide angle. And the VFX providers then go, what the hell is this? This has got a whole different distortion effect on it. And the colors are slightly different. And what the hell, what happened? Um, and we don't want that. That, that's, um, that stifles creativity. So is there a way that we can have things so that, you know, if you throw in a different camera or a different lens or some different metadata hits the workflow, the workflow doesn't creak to a halt or have to stop while someone clarifies what it was. You know, take your spreadsheet example. If someone adds an extra column, did that just th throw off all the references? You know, Excel is smart enough to, you know, you add a column, it's going to recalculate all the references. Well, a workflow doesn't do that. The other applications down the workflow don't understand what happens on either side of them. And we need to change that, right? We need to be able to get to the point where you can have people throw onto a project. Um, you want to add a person, you want to add a task, you want to add a, a different asset. Nothing else should break. We talk um, a lot that's about... what we mean by it. We sort of talk a lot about the sort of the, the publish function uh, a, a lot as well, which I think is a great sort of example of a, of a kind of workflow that, that is right now can still be quite manual, but still is actually sort of software driven, but it's sort of fraught with those sorts of things where you, you know, if you're doing a, a sort of script breakdown and, you know, you've sent the script out to various department heads, you know, sort of wardrobe or casting, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you, they're doing their breakdown. It's things like, well, okay, so now somebody makes a change to that, to what they're doing later on. Well, that's usually an email change. And, oh, I've got to do something, reprint the PDF and send that back out to everybody and the Excel spreadsheet, and everybody's got their own custom little access database that they're plugging everything into and manually copying things over. So when we think about it in the software defined terms, if you think about that as being a driven by a sort of more data driven process, where if somebody changes something, you have the ability to sort of immediately, for, you know, at, at the point it's been approved and you decide you want to push that out, Anybody that has been who is essentially subscribed to and been permission to see or needs to see that piece of information, that can be immediately pushed to, to people, right, into their tools, into the tool set that they use. Um, and, you know, there are VFX sort of push pull processes when you're going from editorial. So you'll push all of this or publish all of these sort of assets out to VFX to do a particular shot. Well, if the editor or director comes in and say even just cuts, you know, three frames out of that shot, right, or changes the timing on it slightly, that all has to be communicated. You got a team of VFX people who are working on that shot and it's now changed. Yeah. And so you want the ability to be able to essentially publish that out immediately, right? And we hear all the stories of like, oh, well, we got that two weeks later. Nobody told us. <laughs> and somebody spent, you know, you've had a team of VFX people working for two weeks on a shot that's different. No right? longer in the edit. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. when we think of software-defined workflows, those are the sorts of examples that we're sort of thinking of. You know, it's, it's, you're not, it's not about, you know, what the director does on set or how they, you know, what the, what the script writer is told to write or, or anything. It's nothing to do with that that sort of side of it. It's not about in getting in the way of the creative process. It's a way of hopefully smoothing some of this sort of the uh, the, the, the email chain that's, you know, on, on its 50th reply, right? And you have no idea what the latest version of something is, you know. Um, on that note, I'm going to, we're running a little short on time. So in order to get to the questions, I'm gonna uh, ask one more question on my end. Um, so you've mentioned that you have a number of partner studios that you work with. Um, so working with all of these major production studios, as you've mentioned, every studio has their own process. Every person within that studio often has their own process quite often. Um, they have different practices, goals, visions. 
it's got to be a little overwhelming at times. <laughs> How do you manage competing interests from and ideas from your member studios? Or is this not an issue for you right now? And if it isn't it's an a, issue, do you see it becoming an issue? <laughs> it's a delight. It works perfectly all the time. <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take um, the I mean, No, the, you know, the, the original vision actually came together really pretty quick. Um, you know, I, I started working on it in, in January and we pulled in a whole bunch of the studio uh, production creative execs and, and we all rallied around it, wrote the paper and got it out by, by September for IBC. So it's actually a pretty, that's not bad. Um, you know, as we get into, so what, what's happened is that there are different studios with different pet projects and they're moving at different speeds. Like one of them was working on this idea of um, sort of defining workflows through data. Um, and having microservices all plug into each other. There's a, they were big on that one. You know, another one was um, big on cloud editorial. There was another one that was working on visual effects, push pulls and stuff. So they're all, they've all got their own internal projects and things they're working on. Um, what we're able to do, if we get it right, is synthesize all that work so that they're all traveling at the speed of the fastest iterating studio, right? So we take what one of them's learning and apply it to the others. And we're sort of, so we're, we can move the bandwagon faster. Um, but I will say it's, this, this 2030 vision is, is kind of, it's gone beyond the studios at this point, right? It's, um, we've got broadcasters looking at it and we've got major tech companies looking at it. So, you know, the big cloud, stu uh, you know, the big cloud companies is three other members of Microsoft, Google, you know, they're all running around this cloud security model and seeing what they can do in their own, um, uh, particular services and, and how you slice them together to make them line up with our, our architecture model. We've got software groups going on with Adobe and the Foundry and um, the big A's, Adobe, Avid, yeah. um, Autodesk. You know, so they're all looking at it. So it's, it's no longer just us and our studio's vision. It's really the industry vision at this point, and, right? And, and we need everyone. There's no way in hell that, you know, a studio on its own or all of them collectively can get the sort of change through a system that we want to go do. And, you know, studios work on, you know, a small percentage of the content that comes out when you look at it, right? Of all the content that's being created from student films to corporate videos to, you know, YouTube videos, right? Studios are making a tiny percentage of that. Um, they tend to do it with a larger budget um, and with more attention and a lot more marketing. But a lot of what we're looking at bubbles down to everyone. That's the sort of, it's, it's sort of, trickle down economics, but for, for workflow and tools. So, you know, if we can, if we can make changes at the top and, you know, Avid or Adobe Premiere picks up some of those changes um, and runs them through for everybody and it becomes part of your, um, your subscription offering, then great. You know, everybody benefits. Um, so we, you know, we talk a lot about movies and visual effects and temp poles and stuff, but I'm constantly reminding people that, you know, it, it is a democratized at this point vision that, the whole industry should be able to rally around. And if we get that right, you know, everyone, everyone benefits and everything becomes a lot more efficient. Um, and we really, by the way, I've got to hammer this point home. We don't have an option to make this industry more efficient. Like we are at capacity. The, we were at capacity in 2019 and then we had, you know, nine months off effectively, sort of enforced nine months off from a pandemic. So now we've got this huge backlog of content that we're trying to catch up with. But the content increase over the last five years has been going up 17% a year in new content being created. Like we don't have enough talent. There's not enough visual effects artists in the world to be able to create all this stuff. We're out of animators and it takes five years to train someone new to be able to do some of that work. So, you know, we don't have an option here. We have to make this workflow more efficient or we can't keep up with the consumer demand for more content. It's just not an option. And the, the role of Movie Labs, I mean, what the reason the studios sort of founded us originally and the projects that we tend to work on are specifically kind of the things where they're not, it's not about competing, right? They obviously, these studios, they are competitors, but obviously there are certain things that they, they do where there's really not a competitive advantage. In fact, there's a competitive disadvantage to doing it alone. And one of our prior projects is on the sort of distribution um, content, right? Where, you know, we have developed a set of standards and specs for, for anybody to publish their content out to distributors in a digital format, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of what we do, we do do some things that we do specifically with the studios, you know, so white paper or work, et cetera. 
But the reason that we uh, release a lot of our stuff into the public domain, um, including a lot of this work, is that we're not doing this just for the studios. We're doing this for the industry. The idea is that by a broader adoption, that's in the studios see that as being there to, to their benefit. So in the case of something like this distribution specs, the idea is it allows people to build systems and put those in place that they and anybody else can use. And it's the same with something like the ontology. The point is the vendors aren't going to just completely redo their software just for the five major studios. Yes. But if they, if they can work on this as an open standard that anybody can use, including other vendors, other competitors to them, it makes sense for them to then start adopting those sorts of things. And that's sort of the strategy. Absolutely. No, and that makes sense. You know, it's, it's an industry where Hollywood does tend to lead the way. I know here in, in, yeah. at Celtics, you know, on our support team, we're always being asked things like, is this script Hollywood standard? Is your budget Hollywood standard? And it's from people who aren't even close to Hollywood, you know, but that's the standard. You have to follow the Hollywood standard. So the 2030 vision of a new Hollywood standard is very exciting to people yeah. like us, really. Um, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to go ahead and let Nicole take over with some questions from our participants. And I'm just going to turn my camera off too, so I'm not distracting anyone. Thank you, Dara. Um, and a huge thank you to Mark and Daniel uh, for that amazing rundown of the 2030 vision. Uh, and also for sharing all of that information with our community. Um, we had so many pre-submitted questions for you folks. Um, and, you know, considering that we're running a little bit behind, I'm just gonna dive right in. Uh, but before I do, I wanna take a moment to thank you, uh, thank our community so much for um, joining us today, submitting the questions in advance for Mark and Daniel. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to jump right into the first um, theme that Dara and I kind of identified from all of the questions that uh, were submitted before the webinar. Uh, this one, I think, is something Mark could answer or speak to. Um, somebody asked, or a lot of folks asked, uh, what comes after streaming? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. I, I think what, what they okay so it, people always confuse business models with delivery um so there's only three business models really there's you know there's a recurring payment and there's advertising or there's a transactional one-off payment like that's it <laughs> that's a, that's the only business models that exist in our, in our industry um people tend to think um streaming is a business model streaming is just a way of getting uh, the, the media to people. The iteration that occurred was around subscription, it was about changing business model. You didn't buy a movie, you just subscribed to Netflix and they streamed it to you. Um, so is there anything beyond streaming? No, probably not, because it's pretty convenient. Um, there may be, you know, at home rendering, but that's a ways off. Um, but streaming's probably here to stay. I think the bigger question is, is subscription and the explosion of content that it has funded is that here to stay? And the answer is yes, but is it sustainable? Um, uh, because right now, I mean, if, if you're any of you like me, I sort of get down and in the evening, I have so many different subscription services I've signed up for. I'm like, I actually don't know what to watch anymore. Maybe I won't even bother. Um, I mean, there's just so much content out there. We may be hitting peak content right? There's peak oil. We may be hitting peak content and then we'd have to worry about, you know, less content, but um, no, probably the shortest way of saying that. Yeah. Great insights. Great questions to ask too. Um, I mm. think about those things all the time, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I hope uh, the folks who ask questions about streaming found that useful. Um, a little follow-up question in the way of streaming. Uh, a few folks asked, has the advent of streaming services, um, megaplex and multiplex theaters, done away with the 90 minute limit imposed by the need to maximize theater attendance? Yes, possibly. Um, but there's another more complicated answer to that as well, which is 
I had this conversation with the CTO of, of Walt Disney one time, Jamie Forrest, um, and he and he said to me, Mark, what's a movie? And I went, what do you mean, what's a movie? Um, it's actually a really hard thing to define what a movie is, right? Because you could, in the old days, you could define it as something that went to theatres first, and then it went to home and, you know, DVD and all that stuff. Well, you can't say that anymore, because there's good movies, you know, award-winning movies going straight to streaming services. So you can't define it by the venue that it's played in, you actually can't define it by its length either. You can't say it's 90 minutes anymore because some movies are longer than that. But you've also got things like, you know, Game of Thrones was arguably movie level production. It just so happened to come out in episodic. Um, so, you know, you could say Game of Thrones was one 40 hour movie. I don't know how long, if you added it up, maybe it's 50, 60, 100 hours. I'm not sure how long it would be. But, you know, that's one really long piece of content. So actually defining what is a, movie is actually becoming less of an issue i think more. Uh, you can go down to the other end of the spectrum which is you know the tiktok video right you know is that a movie i mean TikTok. some of them have a remark kind of do an awful lot in a, yeah. a, a kind of an idea right in a very short space of time right you know they're communicating you know a, a point in sometimes masses right. of seconds right it's a yeah so you really get there's we break our world up into production and distribution and that to me feels like a better way of doing it, which is you can now produce a piece of content for a certain budget um, and then distribute it. And the distribution may be in one way, it may be in different, you know, a mixture of different ways, windowed and or not windowed. But if you if you drive the content creation by the distribution window anymore, you know, that, that's limited thinking. Now it's about let's create a really compelling piece of content. Um, and not be bound by time, going to be bound by budget, but not necessarily bound by the end time. And then we'll see which windows it applies to or how we can make money out of that thing. It's it's much more liberating when you think about it. Agreed, yeah. And I think that's uh, great for the, you know, the creative process in general is to not limit yourself um, and just think of the best content that you can and, and how to make that happen. Uh, really great. That's that's very inspirational, actually. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, moving on to the next uh, kind of theme that we identified in all of the pre-submitted questions. Um, a lot of folks were asking about uh, what writers, like script writers, screenplay, you know, just content writers in general, uh, should be doing to adjust. Um, so the first question out of the, out of these would be as a script writer uh, what measures should I be taking if any to make sure I don't fall behind production advances boy um not fall behind well look here's I mean great content is great content I mean that's the, the one good thing that you know if you're creating great content it, you know you're not going to fall behind the production process um I think there's going to be a whole bunch of changes for writers, um, whether you want it or not. You know, the, the ability to um, collaborate globally um, actually opens up a whole bunch of really interesting things. So, you know, on a on a set, there was a producer would normally close the set and say, "There's only certain people that we want on the set," um, and partly because we don't fly them all around the world. You know, dragging half of uh, half of the the production crowd with us and all the writers and everybody else that comes with it. Um, well, now we've actually been forced into this global collaboration world where, well, maybe you could have writers on the set. Um, they could be appearing virtually. You could have a whole bunch of different people that are there for just certain parts of it. Um, you know, and advances in calendaring and stuff will allow us to actually bring people in just for a moment and say, look at this scene. What do you think? Was that what you meant by it? Is that character reacting in the right way? Like, a lot of what we see as very formal parts of the process are breaking down. Right. So um, virtual production is a great example. Right. So the, the virtual production um, as currently applied, I think it's a terrible phrase, by the way, but as currently applied, it tends to mean these big LED walls that you're, you know, like the Mandalorian where you're shooting um, against a, a, a wall. Um, and that's your visual effects of baked into the camera, which is great. Um, but it completely flips visual effects and post-production. Right. So um, for a start, you need your visual effects assets at the beginning of production um, instead of the end. So, you, you know, you've got to have all your um, 
final quality deliverable production art needs to be there before production, ready to go, and then put up on one of these big walls and you shoot it. And um, because you're recording that output, you actually are making color decisions right then as well, which is gonna be really hard to change later on if you get down to a DI. So it may sound like just a different projection technology, but actually just completely flipped um, some post-production services now worked in, now they've got to be in pre-production. You've got to change it, you budget it for them um, because now they're going to happen first. So these sort of hard boundaries that we used to have between, you know, there's a pre-production phase where you write stuff and then you go and shoot it, then you post it and then you distribute it. That's ah, all changing. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who is writing a, one of these interactive shows for Netflix using their custom tools. And they're talking about it not ever really finishing production. Um, they're going to write hundreds of different endings for this, this piece of content. Um, but then if the community starts reacting and they start branching off down a particular branch and that one seems really interesting, they may keep coming back at it and writing new content and constantly shooting new content and extend that branch out. So, which is really interesting, right? Then it doesn't really have an end. Um, so, that's that's my big takeaway is um you know if i was a writer right now i'd be thinking about you know you you should always be writing for future expansions that may be uh the prequel the sequel the spin-off the 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 web version that is a different delivery on some of these characters and stuff i mean the the explosion in content is really liberating if you're trying to sort of build a, a creative creative world and you may be exploring one storyline but some of those other ones you're thinking oh wouldn't it be great if we could also do those well in the future you may be able to pick up on some of those other sub subplots and expand beyond them so you know that's what i'd be thinking if i were you that's great yeah uh lots to think about there in the ways that you know we write we create uh daniel i didn't know if you had anything to add um no, I, I, I mean, I think a lot of what Mark says is is absolutely, you know, spot on. I think we're not, you know, we're not from the creative side, so it's it's hard for us. We almost uh, speak as as consumers, right, as much as anything. But obviously, you know, we're 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 deeply in this sort of industry, and so I think there is a lot of opportunity. I'm just sitting here thinking we were talking about the sort of the format earlier, but I mean, you know, why is, why are people not playing around with the idea of, of running things simultaneously on TikTok in a very short form while doing something in a longer form and, and using that to develop characters out and, or bring new characters in and try them. And I think, you know, it's not probably me, but you know, I can't believe, you know, someone is not trying that and doing that. And I think that sort of changes. It obviously really opens up a lot of options for, for, uh, for writers yeah. and, and anybody else in, in the creative industry, right? And I'll say one other thing, just because your list of features for next year made me think about it, and Daniel's from the game industry. Um, a lot of the tools for making video games are actually very similar to making yeah. a movie. Um, you know, Maya and, and game engines and stuff are all you very similar process. And, and so on. Yeah. The only really big difference is between a video game and a movie is the sort of fixed narrative in a movie it tends to be a fixed camera shot as well. You know, you get one envelope view of the world in the video game. The, the character has agency and the player has agency and, you know, the characters, the other characters react to what the player is typically doing. Well, you can see a lot of that stuff heading towards each other. And there's now game companies making movies themselves, not trying to get other people to do it badly. Um, but some of these... Um, you know, virtual worlds that have been being created, created in the metaverse and stuff. Um, you'll be able to force them into playing narrative stories through a game engine rendering. And then it really gets hard to say, well, okay, what's a movie and what's a video game then? Um, one is that you can, you have agency, but actually you could lock that down for a while and let it play for a while. And then you give the, the viewer, player, whoever they might be, agency, and then they can affect the world. Um, but, you know, that's incredibly liberating at that point. You're not constrained by technology at all. Then you're constrained by what can you imagine. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and that actually blends itself really well to another question that was asked uh, that, Mark, I think you were pretty excited to answer, which was uh, how is new media and its mediums changing the expectations and the landscape for storytelling? Um, so, yeah, yeah I like... just answered that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that. No. I mean, um, that's the beauty yes. of community questions. You kind of touch on a bunch of different questions that were that were uh, asked with one answer. It was great. Yeah. 
no, I think it's a, it's a great time to be a creative, right? There's, there's more audience uh, or there's more, there's more ways to reach your audience. It's no longer you're constrained by, someone mentioned one of those other questions about, you know, the 90 minutes sort of, that's how long people want to sit in a dark movie theater before they get thirsty from the popcorn. Um, we're not constrained by that stuff anymore. So what a great time to be a creative and go, all right, now, you know, technology is less bounding for me. What is it I can go do? You can still find the budget and, you know, find an audience and find someone to distribute it. But, um, but you aren't necessarily constrained that there is this thing now and I have to create it in this way or, um, you know, that's the, the only outlet I can get for it. I mean, which is another reason why, you know, go back to the very beginning and what we were talking about software defined workflows. You need to be able to have a workflow that is capable of spitting out something as complex as a you know multi uh, multi storyline uh, piece that may have viewers having agency on which version they watch, and a thirty second TV commercial. Well, they're very different worlds, but they use the same tools, literally all the same tools. So, how do you reconfigure them to spit out one in one way, and the next week use the same tools to spit out? Uh, you know, another deliverable is kind of interesting challenge. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and Daniel, do you think the same applies to video games? Well, this is an interesting, you know, go, you know, my, my experience in video games goes back uh, nearly 40 years and, you know, sort of seeing that as that evolved into sort of 3D environments and, and CD which was more narrative based and so on. There was often this debate of, you know, was this going to take over the movie industry and would it all be interactive? And I think, you know, really for me, it was always, we, we would define it in a sense as is it lean back or lean forward, right? And I think there's, it's been proven that, you know, there's room for both, right? There are times when I don't want to engage <laughs> with my TV. <laughs> I yeah. want to sit there <laughs> and be entertained by somebody else, right? And not have to be involved. And then obviously there's other times where, you know, experiences or people that that want, you know, the involvement, that want to sort of have, you know, be interacting in some way, right? And so I think, you know, it, 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 these things are all becoming increasingly blurred, particularly as I say, when we talk about virtual production and where a lot of the gaming technology is coming into the actual creation of, you know, still kind of you know, long, long uh, narrative, you know, uh, uh, work. Um, you know, there's just this increasing kind of blending of, of, of these different um, you know, technologies and forms, which are sort of allowing, I think, a lot more kind of options and ways to go um, with, uh, with, with, yeah, with, with content. And hopefully we'll see that in, in people coming up with fresh ideas, I, right? I, you just made me think of another conversation I was having with someone. I'll give you another example of the ripple effect of, you know, someone making a different decision. I was talking to someone who was talking about frame rates, right? We had that experimentation with The Hobbit a while ago where people are doing 60 frames a second or even faster because you want to get the movement for action scenes. Um, but then there's a whole bunch of, you know, people that go, well, a movie has to be at 24 frames because that's artistic and that's what people expect. And I was talking to someone, I forget who it was now, who was saying, but why? You know, why shoot the entire thing at one frame rate? If you've got a high action sequence, maybe you should go to 60 frames a second and then slow it down to 24 when you're doing a drama scene. And you imagine what would happen <laughs> to a workflow if you had different frame rates arriving. <laughs> I mean, everything would just go to pot right now. Um, but it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting notion. And video games are running 120 frames a second right now, um, you know, in real time with with um, with almost movie quality. I mean, basically Toy Story, the original Toy Story, you can now render on a PlayStation 5 or one of the new Xboxes with, with the right light hitting the scene and stuff. It's, you know, it, it's that level of fidelity in real time. But you can do that in 4K at 120 frames a second. Well, when the movie was made, it was 1080p. Um, at 24 frames a second and it took massive render farms to go get it done so you know you only need to flip that another 10 years forward and go wow you know what could we render at home with that level of movie quality hollywood style um but allow people you know agency to be able to affect it i mean it's sort of brain blending how how fast those graphics are moving towards reality we're gonna run out of time now aren't we <laughs> it's a really uh, interesting topic though. oh absolutely i i mean if it was up to me we would chat for a couple hours but <laughs> unfortunately uh we are almost out of time 
I did have uh, one more question if you're up for it. Yeah, it is. Okay, Let's do it. Perfect. See if we won't be a bit quicker next time. <laughs> uh, I would love it if there was a next time. Um, uh, but this one, I think, is a pretty important question to ask. Um, folks were wondering about how to stay in the know. Um, and if you had any advice, uh, especially for beginners who want to stay knowledgeable about these kinds of developments, um, where could they go to find information and what forums will provide feedback? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll mention your blog again and your LinkedIn page. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. There, good. There's our blog, but there's, um, there's, other, there's other resources out there as well, right? So um, the Academy, the Motion Picture Academy is not just for people making movies. They've got a whole open source software section where they're putting out stuff. They've got a whole new thing starting up around archiving. So there are other, there's a whole bunch of free resources out there that, that, that people are putting out. Like you guys have got a whole library of material. Um, Autodesk has got the same thing on you know, their website. There is so much free content to be able to learn right now. You know, if I was if I was following along, I'd follow, you know, the big cloud companies and their specific media and entertainment blogs, um, the big software tool companies because you really can't get around them, um, and uh, you know, people people like us in the industry forum, and then join more of these sorts of things and and start having the conversation and join the yeah, a lot, the, the uh, a lot of these companies like Netflix has a tech blog and Disney Plus has a tech blog. Um, you know, they yeah. talk about Hollywood some... Post Alliance, follow them on, right. on LinkedIn because yeah. the HBA Tech Retreat is is like the big place in February in Palm Springs where everybody gets together and talks about all this stuff for, for three or four days. Um, but there's all this free content out there that you can you can follow along. It's, a, it's the same problem. This may, may be too much. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for all, all those recommendations. I'm sure we can uh, find links to all of those things and share them with all of our registrants yeah. and our participants after the webinar. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time to answer some of our community questions. Um, hope everybody found uh, it as interesting, intriguing, and inspiring as I did. Um, thank you. Thank you again. And I'll uh, hand it over to Dara for some closing remarks. Don't really have much to say, except also thank you so much. This has been fascinating. I think Nicole and I are going to have to like fly down and have coffee and have the longer chat that we want to have. Yeah, sure. um, <laughs> get away from this. Uh, it's snowing outside right now, actually. So right. we might appreciate we that. We don't have that in LA. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem we've got here either. Yeah. No, definitely not. Um, just to all of our participants, thank you so much for attending. Thank you for your great questions and your comments in the chat. I tried to get in there and answer a few of you. Um, obviously, if you do have follow-up questions, feel free to send them into our support team. And the resources that were mentioned, we'll make sure that those go out with the video recording next week. In uh, an hour or so, you will get a email just asking you how we did today with the brief little survey. And we'd really appreciate you answering that. The most important part of that survey in my experience and from my side of things is asking you what topics you'd like to see for the future. So we do have a plan for next year, but we are flexible. And if a lot of you ask for something, we're gonna get it. So please send your ideas in to us so that we can always stay current with what our clients want to see from Celtics in these webinars. Again, Daniel, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. This has been fascinating. We definitely hope to have you back again next year for some more information and progress. And it's going to be great, actually. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and end us now. Thanks, everyone. Cool. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.